Yes, uh, it's four o'clock from my side, so let's just get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Today is our 24th session, and it is kind of organized by Professor Ked Mauter from the University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you for putting together this session, Kurt. Please take it over. Okay, thank you, Yuen. Thank you very much for your introduction. Welcome everybody to our top webinar today. We have six talks and so we have for every talk a total of 15 minutes. Uh, the idea is that the presenters give a 12 minute talk and then we have a short period of three minutes for presentations, uh, for questions. So without further delay, uh, let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Cheng Liu. Cheng Liu is, from, is an associate professor at Dailan University of Technology in China. He was selected for the Young Talent and Pool program of the Chinese Society of Mechanics. His uh, current research interests are focused on structural uh, optimization and computational mechanics. Um, Chang will in, uh, present his paper entitled Explicit Layout Optimization of Complex RIP Reinforced Thin Wall Structures via Computational Conformal Mapping. Chang, do you want to share your screen and okay. take it okay, from here? Okay. Great. If you get it in full screen mode, we would be very thankful. Great. It's all yours. Okay. Okay. Uh, wait a minute. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm Chang Liu from Dalian University of Technology. The title of my presentation is uh, Explicit Layout Optimization on a Complex River Reforced Single Structure Based on the Wing Multiple Component Method. Uh, this is the outline of, of my presentation. As we know, reinforced single structure have a high strength to weight ratio and therefore are used in a wide range of engineering fields, such as aerospace, automotive, marine, mechanical, and other civil engineering. However, due to the complexity of the topology optimization method, uh, topology optimization problem of reinforced single structures compared to the topology optimization in 2D and 3D flight space, there are only a few studies for the reinforcement. Uh, uh, Ripple reinforced single structure the topology of the optimization. Most of the ex existing work is based on the implicit topology optimization method. In this work, some research directly perform topology optimization of reinforced single structure based on the 3D solid models. Some research use the stiffness increment technology. Uh, uh, technique, technique. However, the 3D solid model will bring huge com computational cost and the uh, uh, stiffness inquiry model is uh, difficult to protect the local response of the structure, such as the stress and the local buckling. In recent years, the topology optimization uh, of reinforced single structure has also been studied under the explicit framework. However, these methods are only are often um, only suitable for uh, one type of single structure and uh, have, have not been extended to a single structure with a complex medium surface. Uh, in commercial software, the topology optimization uh, of single structure is also generally based on the 3D solid models, uh, which also have had the drawbacks of the huge computational cost and requires a complicated post processing. To develop an explicit topology optimization method for complex uh, reinforced single structure, we need to address two challenges. The first challenge is how to Explicitly, explicitly describe the ribs using the geometric parameters. Oh. The second challenge is how to parametrically describe the medial surface of the complex single structures. In this work, based on the mean multiple component method, we proposed an explicit topology optimization method of various kinds of complex reinforced single structure. In MC method, a number of multiple components are chosen as the building block, block for topological design. The optimal structure topology is determined by optimizing the uh, geometric information, uh, geometric parameters such as the size, shape, and the layout of the components. Comparing with the implicit topology optimization method, the MC method describes the structure topology explicitly and uses very few design variables. The MC method can be performed under the 
you learn under the Lagrangian description, under the Lagrangian, under the Lagrangian, under Lagrangian description, we have the explicit geometry information of the boundaries of the components. Uh, as you in this figure, in our approach, the key idea is to treat the ribbons at the source of uh, at, at the single components. For for flat single single structure, we have the explicit geometry information of each phase of the uh, single component, and the movement and the deformation of of the ribbons can be um, driven directly by the efficient ship sensitivity. For single structure with the curved median surface. The problem is how to arrange the rib component on the cold surface and ensure the fit of the rib to the surface during the optimization process. To solve this problem, in our approach, the cold surface will first be permitted rather using the nerves or CCM techniques, and then a one to one mapping relationship will be built between the cold surface and a regular flat parametric region. Based on the above mapping technology, we can first uh, arrange, uh, arrange the rib component on the uh, flat parametric region and then map the rib to the curved surface. After that, the final element analysis and uh, optimization can be performed on the real physical region. Since the curved surface uh, has been parameterized, we can also uh, easily get the uh, geometric information of uh, each phase of the rib, ribs on the curved surface. In the general MSU method, components can overlap and cover with each other. However, for the single structure, uh, single structure topology op optimization, the overlapping and the covering of the ribbon components will cause unclear uh, geometric details, which is not benefit for the finite element analysis and the geometric reconstruction. To limit the overlap and the cover of the ribbon components, we develop a node driving adaptive ground structure approach. In this approach, the movement of the components is driven by the common nodes, common nodes between the ribs, and the feature size of the ribs can also be optimized. At the end of the optimization, we can remove the ribs uh, whose, whose thickness is less than a given threshold, thus raising the change of the rib topology. Based on the above this, uh, discussion, the mathematical formulation of the single structure optimization problem is as follows. In this work, the considered the, the considered the topology optimization is allowed to minimize the complex of the whole structure. To design the design variables only include the coordinates of the multiple uh, uh, movable nodes and the geometric parameters of the components. In the Find the element analysis that we use an efficient four shear model and the adaptive body fitted mesh. For sensitivity, the key point is to find the relationship between the uh, normal velocity uh, and the data variables. Since uh, we have the explicit geometry, geometric information of each phase of the uh, ribbon component, we can easily obtain the uh, shape sensitivity. So this, this page shows the flow chart of the proposed method. First, for a, a given cover surface, we use NURBS or system technique to reconstruct the parametric model of the single structure. Then the matching technique is used to arrange the grip component on the curved surface. Next step, the single structure is uh, discreted into adaptive body fit mesh and the finite element analysis is performed. Uh, then conclude the sensitivity and the update to the data, uh, update to the data robots. When the uh, optimization converge, the rib component with thickness uh, uh, less than the uh, threshold are removed and the final data results are obtained. Uh, obtain. The third part, uh, in this section, we will use several numerical examples to demonstrate the effectiveness of our method. The first example is the uh, flat plant and reinforced structure. And this move should the uh, optimization process of our method. Compared with the topology optimization of a single structure in commercial software, our method directly uses the explicit geometry parameters uh, of the rib components as design variables. And the optimization result can be easy to connect to CD system. Jane, three minutes. The, okay, okay. 
The second example is a code refers the stream structure. This figure shows the uh, initial initial rib component in the parameter region and the physical region. Uh, in this example, we use uh, 204 components and uh, 330 design variables. This figure shows the optim optimized design. Uh, as it can be seen, our approach can obtain clear rib reforms layouts without any post processing. And thanks to the four shell analysis model, we can easily get the local response of a structure, which is difficult to achieve with the stiffness equivalence method. This page shows a more complex flower shaped uh, shell example. Note, note that also this structure is uh, uh, this structure has a simple topology. The shape of its geometry is uh, somewhat complex. For such a structure, if the global mapping is built by only one patch, the complexity of the surface shape will lead to uh, distortion of the rib layouts in the physical space. Therefore, we first uh, divide this structure into several patches. This patch is parameterized, uh, and uh, then we uh, assemble them. This figure shows the initial design, and uh, this is the optimization result. OK, this page shows a uh, uh, T-branch pipe example. This structure also, also requires multi-patch parameterization uh, before the overall parameterization. Uh, after the parameterization process, uh, also the parameterization process seems complex. It should note that uh, it only needs to do one time before the optimization. Uh, this page shows the initial data and the uh, optimization results of this example. Uh, in addition, our method also can be used for optimization of other kinds of similar structures, such as the sandwich structure and the a uh, single structure with curved ribs. A more example can be found in our, uh, our paper. Uh, at last, I will give some uh, concluding remarks. In this work, a unified framework for explicit layout topology optimization of various kinds of reinforced, reinforced single structure is proposed. The proposed framework has few design variables and can easily, and can easily control the feature size of the rib components. The optimization uh, the optimization results can be easily imported into the CD system. Future, re future, re research, uh, future research direction may include the topology optimization of a single structure involved in multiple FE models and the single structure optimization considering uh, complex multi-physics multi fields. Uh, oh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Cheng, thank you very much for your, this really nice talk. I know you don't have a lot of time. Um, how about you unshare your screen and Nico starts uh, sharing his screen okay. while we have an opportunity to ask um, a few questions. So everybody in the audience, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay. Are there any questions? If this is not the case, um, one obvious question is um, how about how sensitive is the final result you get to the initial layout of your of your structure? So you you show that you start essentially with this adaptive ground structure approach. What happens if you radically see that differently? Uh, you mean the initial depends? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Karsh. <laughs> Share my screen. screen. Uh, I think we are beyond okay. that. Maybe you just answer it yeah. by yeah. okay. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. It. Okay, okay. This is uh, this is an example. In this example, we use three different initial data uh, for this two hundred components, four hundred components, and six hundred components. And uh, uh, this is the uh, results. Uh, we can see that for this three uh, initial design, the obtained the result is uh, very similar. Okay, and is this something you observe all the time, or is this just a lucky? You know, is this a good example? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, our method is a ground uh, structure method, and so it's uh, <laughs> it uh, it have the uh, initial difference. 
Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So if you could okay, share your thank screen. You. Thank you again for your great uh, you presentation. It was very nice and your results are very impressive. Okay, let's move on to our second talk. Uh, we switch from structural mechanics to fluid mechanics. And it, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Nikolaos Galanos. Uh, Nico Galanos is a PhD student at the Parallel CFD and Optimization Unit at the School of Mechanical Engineering at the National Technical University of Athens. He's working on the development of a joint methods for topology and shape optimization in conjugate heat transfer problems. So Nico, if you maybe can get your screen, yes, perfect uh, in full, uh, your, yeah, you did it in full screen mode, perfect. So it's all yours, Nico. Okay, hello, thank you very much. Uh, so this talk that I will give focuses on the synergistic use of a joint based topology and shape optimization for designing bifluid heat exchangers. Uh, this work was performed primarily at the Parallel CFD and Optimization Unit of the National Technical University of Athens uh, in collaboration with uh, people from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Japan. Uh, so, uh, in the presented study, uh, uh, there are several key components which are involved. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we make use of an adjoint based uh, topology optimization to design bifluid heat exchangers, uh, where it is important that we have non mixing fluids. Uh, in this work, topology optimization makes use of an artificial impermeability field to define its design variables, uh, through which it introduces Brinkman source terms to the flow equations to weakly impose boundary conditions. And it also makes use of uh, interpolations of thermophysical properties for the energy equation. Uh, in addition, uh, we make use of a low cost Darcy like flow model and its adjoint uh, to initialize the design variables of topology optimization at low cost. Uh, and finally, we apply shape optimization uh, in conjugate heat transfer problems such as heat exchangers. Uh, and this type of optimization has been tackled also in the past by our group. Uh, over and above uh, all these me methods, which I just mentioned, uh, which are uh, which can be met in the literature, were uh, enriched in this uh, study by making the following contributions. Uh, first of all, to enhance the accuracy of topology optimization, we propose a new interpolation scheme for the thermal conductivity uh, to be used in order to accurately compute heat fluxes close to the fluid and solid interface. Uh, we are combining topology and shape optimization into a single framework to design heat exchangers uh, and in, in order to benefit from both methods. And to do so, we have developed a framework that we call topology to shape transition, uh, which enables us to extract a surface representation of the topology optimization solution. Uh, at this point, let me also mention that both topology and shape optimization in this work are based on the development of the continuous adjoint method in open flow. Uh, to save some time, I will explain the framework that we have developed uh, through the application that we are dealing with. And the application is the design of this counter flow heat exchanger, where we have a hot fluid that in this case is air, entering from eight small inlet ducts on one side and exiting from a single outlet duct on the other side. Uh, for the cold fluid that in this case is water, we have the exact opposite configuration. Uh, and the goal is to maximize the heat that is being transferred from the hot to the cold fluid by practically minimizing the outgoing enthalpy flux of the hot fluid at the exit. And we also want to minimize volume average total pressure losses for both fluids. Uh, and since this is a two objective minimization problem, we are concatenating the two into a single objective function uh, by using a pair of equal weights. Uh, also, this optimization problem includes a set of constraints. Uh, first, and it is important to make sure that the two fluids are not mixing during the optimization. So we want to control the minimum solid thickness that separates them. Uh, also, we want the cold fluid to be equidistributed at the eight blue exits. And finally, we are imposing volume constraints on both fluids uh, in order to avoid the formation of isolated fluid pockets uh, in the optimized designs. Uh, now, regarding the design variables of the topology optimization, uh, we use a single field that we denote with the Greek letter alpha, uh, uh, which 
uh, is used to identify areas in the domain being occupied by either of the two fluids or the solid. Uh, and a crucial part in this framework is the usage of a double regularization and projection strategy in order to compute two auxiliary quantities that we call Xi1 and Xi2, where areas with Xi1 equals one are occupied by the first fluid and areas with Xi2 equals one are occupied by the second fluid, which in this case is the hot one. Uh, and since this uh, formulation for topology optimization has been used in previous words, which are cited, I uh, will not spend much more time in this slide. Uh, now for the flow modeling, we solve the navier stokes equations coupled with the spallet armalas turbulence model and the iconal equation to compute distances once for each of the fluids, uh, incremented by Brinkman penalization terms to enforce an almost zero flow solution in the solidified parts of the domain. Now for the energy equation, uh, we solve it over the entire flow domain. And in order to do that, we also need to interpolate the thermal conductivity values of the three involved uh, media uh, based on the values of the uh, identifier fields C1 and C2. Uh, a common approach in the literature is to use the SIMP interpolation. Uh, here, since we are solving this equation using the cell-centered finite volume method, we are interested in kappa values at uh, cell phases. And for this reason, we propose this new interpolation of kappa at cell phases based on C1 and C2. Uh, we're close to the fluid and solid interface. We want kappa to have the value inside this red rectangle. Uh, and this value is inspired by how temperature continuity and heat flux conservation are imposed as boundary conditions in CHT simulations with body fitted grids. Where in this figure, assuming that the left control volume is occupied by fluid and the right one is occupied by solid, Kappa at the interface should have this value to accurately compute the heat flux. And the proof of this formula can be found in the appendix of the full paper. Uh, now, starting the topology optimization with a good initialization for the design variables might significantly reduce its cost. Uh, in this work, we make use of a uh, low cost and low fidelity Darcy like flow model to initialize the design variables. Uh, that is derived from the uh, Navier-Stokes equations by making these two assumptions. And practically it says that the velocity at its grid position is uh, directly pro proportional to the uh, local pressure gradient. So we can perform an optimization using this uh, lower cost uh, flow model, uh, which is significantly uh, faster compared to the RANS one, since we only need to solve one uh, PDE for its fluid, the continuity equation just to compute the pressure. Now, since inertial forces were eliminated in order to derive this uh, flow model, uh, we need to devise uh, a proper objective function that expresses the total pressure drop for between inlets and outlets in order to run the optimization. And since we cannot use the surface-based objective function which I showed previously, here we minimize this volume-based objective function. Uh, now, in this slide, I want to talk about uh, continuous adjoint, which is used in this work in order to compute sensitivity derivatives uh, and, of, and constraints uh, with respect to design variables. Uh, and apart from the continuous adjoint PDEs, uh, which you see here developed for the RANS model, uh, the develop, uh, we have also developed continuous adjoint for the low cost Darcy like uh, variant of topology optimization. And also, I want to mention that. In this work, continuous adjoint is implemented in the adjoint optimization form library of OpenFOAM, uh, which is made publicly available by our group. Uh, but in this work, it was extended to permit topology optimization with two fluids and also conjugate heat transfer. Nico, three minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so going back to the heat exchanger, uh, we start the design by running the Darcy-based topology optimization, start from an all solid domain. Uh, and the optimization ran for almost one hour on 128 CPU cores. Uh, and at the end, we obtained, uh, it was able to generate flow, flow paths, uh, fully connecting inlets and outlets for both fluids, as you see here. Uh, so the Darcy-based topology optimization provides us with a very good initial solution uh, in order for us to continue with a runs-based optimization. Uh, and the reason why this solution that came from Darcy topology optimization was used as initialization is the following. Uh, if you see this figure, uh, then based on the low cost Darcy model, the cold fluid is almost perfectly equidistributed at the eight exits. But when this solution is re-evaluated with the RANS model, uh, we see that the flow equidistribution constraint is not met. 
And for this reason, we were obliged to continue with the Iran's topology in order to obtain the design that you see on the right, which achieves significantly lower total pressure drop for both fluids compared to the one that came from the RC topology optimization and also meets the flow equidistribution constraint. Uh, so at this point, we want to uh, uh, extract the fluid solid interface for both fluids and reevaluate this solution with body fitted grids in order to be more confident in the computed performance of the design that we that we have. And to do that, we follow the topology to shape transition process that consists of three steps in this work, uh, where assuming that this is the mesh of topology optimization and red identifies solid cells and blue fluid cells. Then in the first step, we want to identify the faces that define the interface, shown here in green. And since this interface is possibly jacked and staircase-like uh, looking, uh, in the second step, we want to regularize it by solving the laplace beltram equation. And based on the solution of this equation, we move grid nodes on the interface to come up with a smoother representation, which at the last step, we store in STL file format uh, in order then to proceed with the generation of body fitted grids. Uh, so we did this process for the examined heat exchanger to obtain the two fluid manifolds that you see here, which we reevaluated using proper body fitted grids in order to uh, see that uh, the cold fluid is not again perfectly distributed at the eight exits when it's reevaluated with a body fitted grid, and also where there are discrepancies in the computed total pressure drop. And for this reason, uh, we these two reasons provide us with an incentive to continue with a shape optimization of the heat exchanger, which in this work is performed using a preform deformation tool of based on volumetric bis splines, uh, the one that you see here to parameterize the shape. And it ran for almost uh, 15 uh, hours in order then to achieve uh, a 30% reduction in total pressure drop for both fluids compared to the starting point of the optimization. And the most important thing here is that the solution that we get from this optimization, the one that you see here, uh, is a solution which performance we can actually transit. It was run, it was performed on body fit grids. And finally, to summarize, uh, here I present the complete framework to design heat exchangers that consists of four individual steps, a Darcy-based topology optimization that in this work uh, lasted for one hour, a runs based topology optimization that ran for 10 hours and the safe optimization that took uh, almost 15 hours, summing up to a total of 24 hours of on four AMD 32 core CPUs that were available at that time in our cluster. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are questions, I am happy to answer. Nico, thank you so much for this terrific talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Again, we have a few minutes for questions, so please unmute yourself and feel free to ask a question. Again, I think people are just shy because I think there are many questions. So then let me ask a question. So just looking at your results, how important is the RANS topology optimization step in between? Or in other words, why could you not just take the Darcy topology optimization results and run a shape optimization directly on that? Uh, we could actually do that, but uh, we felt that it's good to further refine the solution using the RANS topology optimization uh, in order to, let's say, benefit a bit from the uh, fact that you can more or less change the topology. Uh, for example, uh, the, this fluid in the Dorsey topology is connected to the uh, top part let's say, of the design space. Uh, this would not be able to be disconnected if we just run shape optimization. Whereas with topology, you see that uh, we have, let's say, a bit of a change. Okay. This okay. could be used done with shape. Okay. Okay. You convinced me. Yes, it's needed that you run the RANS topology optimization. Okay. Uh, again, short, sorry for the, the real rush. You know, okay, I think it's the format of the top webinar. So thank you again, Nico. It was a great talk. And we can go to the next speaker. We stay in the area of fluid. So Nico, if you could unshare such that Kerry can um, share his screen. Thank you. Our next speaker is Harrison or Harry Nobis. 
Harry is a PhD student at uh, KTH in Stockholm in Sweden. He's in his final year, so he's looking forward to get a real life. His PhD is on developing novel surface structures to influence laminar turbulent transition. And his main focus of his PhD has been on topology optimiz optimization using such surfaces. So Harry, please take it over and you have overall 12 minutes. Lovely, thank you. Thank you for a lovely introduction. Um, yes, so my name is Harry and um, we've been working more on the fluid side. So what we're presenting today is how we've been taking the disciplines of topology optimization and applying them to designing super hydrophobic surfaces, which are able to delay laminar turbulent transition. So this work is conducted by myself, along with Philip Schlatter and Dan Henningsen from KTH, Eddie Wardbro from Karlstadt University and Martin Bergren from Umeå University. Now, I'm going to assume that everyone in this webinar has a fundamental understanding of topology optimization, but I would like to begin my presentation with a brief introduction about laminar turbulent transition, as well as superhydrophobic services, as these may not be such familiar concepts. Um, I'd then like to move on to some of the uh, methodologies, but more importantly, I'd like to talk about some of the results that we found by optimizing these superhydrophobic services. So here we can see a channel flow. And upstream, we have a laminar regime, and downstream, we are turbulent. And our research group is particularly interested in the transitional process between these two states, right? Or even better, looking at ways to control this transition process. Now, unfortunately, studying laminar turbulent transition is notoriously difficult. It's inherently non steady. It's um, <clears throat> the Navier Stokes equations are nonlinear, turbulence is chaotic, and we're looking at the growth of very small perturbations. So we need very accurate numerical methods in order to capture all this phenomenon. This being said, it's very important research. If you're able to control this transition process, you can transport fluids more, uh, more efficiently, you can reduce drag in your vehicles and improve stall characteristics around things. It can be very, very powerful. And what we're hoping for is that by using topology optimization, we'll be able to uncover some of these novel structures and surfaces, which can help us delay transition. So the inspiration for this particular project came from a 2020 JFM by Pikeller and friends, where they were looking at how you could use super hydrophobic surfaces to delay this transition process. So again, very quick introduction on super hydrophobic surfaces. Essentially, on a microscopic level, they have this surface roughness such that if you embed them into a fluid, it, it, it traps a gas layer through surface tension. And this gas layer acts sort of like a lubricating surface. So if you look on a more macroscopic level at the flow over these surfaces, instead of having a no slip boundary condition, you have this partial slip velocity at the wall. So you can see this is characterized by essentially a Robin condition where this LS is known as our slip length. And what's key here is that this slip length is a property of the superhydrophobic surface. So you can manufacture surfaces which have a large slip length, or you can manufacture surfaces which have a small slip length. Now, Pikeller and stuff, they were looking at homogeneous surfaces, so surfaces where you have the same slip length everywhere. What we wanted to do is say, let's make this slip length a function of our material indicator and see if we can design the macroscopic layout of these superhydrophobic surfaces. To be more specific, if we imagined having two different superhydrophobic paints, could we paint this pattern which would delay transition further than a homogeneous counterpart? And more importantly, could we find this pattern using topology optimization? So again, returning to our transitional channel, what we see is that we have a 3D computational domain. So we're governed by the Navier-Stokes equations in here. And our Reynolds number based on the half channel height and equivalent center line velocity is 5,000 here. So we're looking at subcritical transition. But we also have this 2D optimization domain on the top and bottom surfaces where we can paint our two different superhydrophobic paints, right? And these two numbers that we've chosen from the slip lengths, they're arbitrary, but arbitrary within reason in the sense that people have manufactured superhydrophobic surfaces with these slip lengths. So a boundary condition here is we're zero velocity in a normal direction. And if we project onto the tangent plane, we have that same Robin condition as before, where this slip length could vary in space. But also periodic in the spanwise direction, we have an outflow with a little sponge, and our inflow comes from an analytical solution, which looks very similar to Poise flow, except you have this slight little slip velocity on the side. Now, we're triggering something which is known as K-type transition, which is a very fundamental sort of canonical transitional um, <clears throat> case that we superimpose on top of our inlet a relatively large amplitude 2D primary disturbance, often called a Tongan-Schlissling wave or TS wave, 
and then two relatively small amplitude oblique waves, which will seed our secondary instability. Now, I want to briefly mention that we generally use alpha and beta to denote our streamwise and spanwise wave numbers. So when I'm talking about distance here, so streamwise distances in our channel, I'll be talking about the wavelength of the primary instability. So you can see here we have 10 wavelengths long plus an extra half a wavelength to account for that sponge. Now, if we do this transition, so if we run, if we run this transition, an important quantity to track in order to look at the transition location is known as the friction Reynolds number. So this number will be relatively low in a laminar regime and then be relatively high in a turbulent regime. So we've arbitrarily chosen that when our friction Reynolds number is 150, that will be our transition location. So you can see for this particular case, um, at 5.5 wavelengths, we have reached transition. Now what's more important to visualize other than the, uh, <clears throat> other than the velocity is the coherent structures. So here I'm plotting the lambda two structures and I'm coloring the top surfaces in red and the bottom surfaces in blue. And you can see this typical K-type transition scenario. We start with a 2 DTS wave and then those oblique waves begin to modulate it until we reach what's known as a lambda vortice, which becomes a hairpin vortice and ultimately transitions to turbulence. Now I understand that perhaps for everyone in this room, this is a lot of information very quickly coming from a field which is not quite your own. Um, but what I really want to stress with all of this is that I've done nothing special here. This is a very standard transition scenario that dates back to the mid 90s and nothing special has happened here. What is going to be special is for us to ask the question, can we design a surface, a superhydrophonic surface, which will delay this transition scenario? Okay, so the way we go about this is we start by restricting our domain to the early stages of transition and we seek to minimize the dissipation in some downstream location. Now, this is of course not a formal definition of transition location, but the dissipation will be rather large in a turbulent regime and rather small in a laminar regime. So we're hoping that by minimizing this quantity will implicitly promote laminarity and hence shift this transition location further downstream. Um, now we use a standard density-based method for topology optimization. So we start by solving our forward problem, which involves first finding a steady base flow and then simulating this transition scenario. So this is essentially all the animations that I've been showing so far. We then solve our adjoint equations backwards in time to get our sensitivity information. And all four of these simulations are conducted in the spectral element method code uh, NET5000. And spectral methods are used a lot in stability calculations because they're very accurate. They suffer from very little numerical diffusion. And for NEC 5000 specifically, they are, uh, it's a very well parallelized code. So it allows us to address very large scale transition scenarios. We also use the Revolve algorithm to handle checkpointing for our unsteady adjoint calculations to avoid any sort of data management issues. Um, we then update our design with just a parallel implementation of the method of moving systems. So as we move on to our results, I want to first direct your attention to the top left corner where we have our objective function expressed as a percentage of the first iteration. So we're going to start off at 100% here and hopefully this will decrease. In the top right hand corner, I have some images of what our design looks like. So both the top surface and the bottom surface, I'll be using black to denote our least slippery material and white to denote our most slippery material. So you can see we're starting off all white implying we're homogeneous with the most slippery material as our initial guess. I also like to point out that I've replicated the design here once in the spanwise direction to really highlight that periodicity, right? We're periodic in the spanwise direction. We also have on the bottom surface, oh, sorry, in the bottom picture, we have again an instantaneous, an instantaneous snapshot of these flow structures where we have red on the top and blue on the bottom. Now, as we move through this convergence history, I'd like to make a couple of comments. First, as we're placing material down, thank God our objective function is going down. But also, as we converge on a design, we are not symmetric on the top and bottom surfaces, which was interesting, at least to me, because we put a lot of effort when we're constructing this objective function to be as fair as possible to the top and bottom surface. We can see this region is over just one wavelength and the time integration is over exactly one period. So this was at least surprising for me. And another thing I would like to point your attention to are these two lambda structures on the top surface. So this red M shape looking thing. And as we move through and place more material on the top surface, we see the phase of that invert. So turning from an M shape into a W shape. And we'll see why that's important later on. Harry, um, three minutes. Oh, okay. So um, just to summarize, 
not symmetric on the top and bottom and larger than the fundamental spanwise wave number. If we compare it to our reference cases, you can see the no slip case is the first one to transition. If we paint the whole surface with our least slippery materials, so that would be like coloring the whole thing in black, we get a slight improvement in transition location. If we use our most slippery material, we again get a slightly improvement, uh, improvement in transition location. But our optimized design actually transitions 29% further downstream than if we were to use just the slipperiest material. So it's a huge improvement. And for my favorite slide in the whole presentation, if we look at these coherent structures, you can see quite clearly how the transition location has been pushed far downstream. And again, quick reminder, red is the top surface, blue is the top bottom surface. We had more material on the top surface. And you can see that we've broken this classical K-type symmetry um, by having an asymmetry in our top and bottom surface. So this was really interesting to me. Now, I know I'm running out of time. I would like to mention, I'll leave this up for a little bit longer. Everything I've presented right now is not actually what's in the paper that we published. This is known as spatial transition. Um, we published a paper on temporal transition, which means you take just a little box of one wavelength and add another periodic direction, right? So now everything involves in time as opposed to evolving in space. So the methodologies are almost exactly the same. And we were also able to find very interesting surfaces which could delay transition in time further than a homogeneous counterpart. The only difference is we're now not only periodic in the spanwise direction, our designs are also periodic in the streamwise direction. Now, we also looked into things like changing the amplitude and changing the phase and doing ensemble optimizations over different phases. So if you found this presentation interesting, I strongly encourage you to read the full paper because there's lots of other goodies in there to check out. Um, but for now, could we paint a pattern which further delays transition? Yes, we could. And most importantly, we were able to find these patterns using topology optimization. So that'll be the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Harry, thank you very much. Really great talk. Very interesting results. Uh, I, I would argue, you know, you definitely took the world of flow topology optimization into a new regime. That's very interesting. But I want to open up. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, who in the audience would like to ask a question? Don't be shy. I can go for the first one. So thank you very much for interesting talk. What is the reason uh, you think uh, the, uh, the design in the top surface and bottom is not symmetric as you expected? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough, I, I don't want to comment so strongly because it's, I'd love to say that it is to break this K-type symmetry, but I can't say for sure that that is necessarily beneficial. I, I skipped a few slides earlier that um, when you study these sort of transition scenarios, it's also important to look at the growth of this primary instability and these secondary instability modes. So here you can see the primary instability is decaying and the secondary instability is growing exponentially, and that's how K-type transition works. And what we found is that over our uh, um, <clears throat> optimized surface, we actually inhibit the growth of those secondary instability modes. So that is actually our main explanation for why we delay transition and also for why it also worked in a temporal case because we get a similar delay in transition in a temporal case. So I don't wanna say necessarily it's because we break that transition, uh, we break that symmetry. So I think you could also delay transition without breaking that symmetry. So I'm sorry if that's not a very good answer. Okay. I don't want to say no. anything too fast. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for another quick one. If Anybody I else? Also ask one. Yeah, please go ahead, Nico. Uh, congratulations for the presentation. Very nice. Uh, since you're running unsteady simulations and turbulent ones, which the flow is quite chaotic, and you're using a joint, uh, have you ever noticed any issues in the convergence of the adjoint method? Oh, that is such a huge question that we definitely don't have time to answer. But yes, if you're referring to sort of the work of Chi Chi Wang and his, or, or originally by Leah of the exponential growth of your adjoint through chaotic dynamical systems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll notice that we restricted our domain, our optimization domain to really neglect also to cut out a lot of the turbulent fluctuations and that was really really important if we had a domain that went through all of these turbulent fluctuations i think we would be in a lot of trouble okay great thank you, thank you very much uh, we are out of time here let's transition to our next talk
we stay very close to Stockholm. Hmm. We move just a little bit to the west, um, and we are now at the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bryce Rogier. Bryce is a PhD, uh, got his PhD in heat transfer applied to microelectronics problems from the University of Paris, Nanterre. Nanterre. Since then, Price has been working as a postdoc at uh, DTU, working on the optimization fl of fluidic and thermal systems. Currently, Price is working on the optimization of heat exchangers using a large scale using large scale computing. Um, Bryce, could you share your screen, please? Yes. And then you... it's all yours. We see you, and hopefully, we see your slides soon. Uh, it is sharing actually. I think you share maybe with the wrong screen. So we, we see you, yep. which is nice, but I think okay. you don't want to do that. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. Okay, great. Terrific. It's all yours, Bryce. Thank you. And yes, uh, we'll stay in a uh, 3D simulations, but on a more, uh, I guess, simple uh, laminar flow. So the questions of the motivations of our, of our paper was to, uh, to actually found out that if you do the full 3D topology optimization for post convection and the heat sinks, how much more we can gain for from the more conventional 2D simulations. So in the literature, usually you see what they call pseudo 3D, where the velocity and the temperature profile in the normal direction is uh, uh, prescribed. So it's basically a 2D simulation with, a, with an assumption on the, on the other direction. And these actually work great. But as uh, you go for uh, heat sinks for modern uh, architectures, then the pressure drop increases, and uh, then this is not enough to actually gain performances for for heat sinks geometries. So you can see some examples also on the right that uh, this is uh, our paper is based mostly on this uh, uh, implementation of three uh, D topology optimization. So the what kind of heat sink we're actually looking at? So on the left you see a picture of a real uh, what you call cold plate, which is used in your uh, everyday PC. Uh, so they are pretty simple. It's just straight fins, but the fin pitch and the channel size is pretty small, so around 0.2 millimeters. And if you want to model a whole heat sink, then you will. It's an approximation uh, need around 100 million elements. If you need to uh, discretize accurately the, uh, the the fin and the channel size, and of course it's not everyone that can access to a supercalculator that can go for 100 million elements and almost a billion uh, degree of freedom. So in this paper, we just uh, restricted the size domain to only five fins, so we have a much more uh, small mesh, and also that our computation time doesn't take uh, half a year. So then about the topological optimization of a heat sink, it's a pretty classic conjugate heat transfer problem that I guess most of you already know. Uh, it's a standard one-way coupling of between the navier stokes equations and the convection diffusion equation. We use the RAM formulations for the uh, inverse uh, permeability alpha and a SIP formulation for the thermal conductivity. Uh, then the objective here is to minimize the, the Temperature of the bottom side of the of the heat sink, where you have the heat flow, uh, heat flux, sorry, uh, applied, and then the pressure is the constraint here, and also a volume constraint. Then we use actually uh, uh, in-house C plus plus FPM codes, uh, and we use the PETC library to handle uh, all the, the all the solvers. And then the simulation time is around eight minutes per iteration, which is pretty good, considering that we have a 4.2 million element mesh uh, and it, we use 72 cores on this one. So uh, what about the, uh, actually, how do we, do we handle the, the comparison between a 3D uh, topology optimization uh, simulation and what we call the pseudo 3D? Uh, we applied some uh, machining or some uh, design filterings, and uh, you can see that uh, on, 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 your, on the middle, uh, you the, sorry, the filter, so the element, the, the material will be able to grow into a single direction, and it will be actually accessible to a milling machine, uh, hence uh, reducing the complexity for manuf manuf manufacturing this, uh, 
designs and the 2D extrusion filter is just that the milling angle will be 90 degrees. And this work has been done by uh, Matisse Langela that I saw in the chat. So uh, thank you for your really good uh, work that we applied in this, uh, in this paper. So different designs here. Uh, it's just, just to show before going to the performance side how different they might look. So from the most uh, complex on the left to the more simple on the right. And the good thing is uh, the one on the right with the extrusion, extrusion filter really looks like the one you will get with a sort of 3D formulation. So it will be ideal to compare performances uh, of these uh, designs. Then about the flow visualization. So why I had this slide is not only to show how good I am at power review, but it's, uh, it's mostly to show on the velocity field that uh, you will have a, a lot of, uh, of acceleration of the flow in all direction, especially on the one of the classic PD filter. So the flow will go down, left, right, down, uh, up. Whereas if you look at the 2.5D filter, it will mostly go from left to right, left to right, depending on where the fins are located. It just means that if you use these uh, good filters for manufacturing, then you will lose a lot of uh, flexibility for the flow to reach the, versus the, the places where the heat flux is the highest. So it's really good for uh, to bring the design to your, to your I guess, uh, lab, but then of course you will lose some performance. And then actually before uh, going to the performance, I want to highlight some, some uh, things that uh, we think we don't see enough uh, in, in papers about topology optimization is uh, how to actually get a good mesh from your topology optimization framework to, uh, for instance, a commercial CFD software when you do the post-validation. Because this is something we have uh, actually struggled a lot. And I think it's pretty important to show how and to be clear how we do that. So if you take the CFT, uh, the results of the top of optimization using PowerView here, you will recognize the kind of standard Lego shape cubic um, uh, densities. So from that, we actually project the densities which are uh, cell-based to the nodes. And then we get a much smoother field, which will, will be beneficial when you mesh these uh, this geometries. Then from that, we use uh, an ISO surface to extract the, the STL file of the solid parts. And here we'll just talk in a second why we have two different thresholds. This X is just the densities. From that, uh, we use a measure to get both the solid and the fluid part and the interface in between. And this, we use trellis uh, for this. And then we, you can export it and import the mesh into a, a commercial safety software, for instance, if you want to use fluid. And why we have here two different thresholds is just that usually you might think that using uh, the 0 0.5, which is uh, just the, the average between zero and one, you will get straight away the same results uh, doing the post evaluation, but it's not the case, at least for when you have a kind of a high, higher pressure. And usually you have to push towards the one to get actually the, the values that match the, between the, your framework and the CFT validation, at least for the objective and the pressure. And this right, is not- three minutes. Yeah. And this is not, uh, this value is actually pretty uh, dependent on your pressure drop on your flow speed. So now the performance comparison. Uh, here you have two main graphs. So one, the objective, depending on the Reynolds number. So we extended the range um, of, the, of the flow speed or the volume flow rate. And then on the right, the objective and the pressure drop. So if you just look at the one on the left, you might say that your actually design is not good because it doesn't outperform the, uh, the reference, which has only five straight fins. That's true. It's mostly because the, 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 um, the heat sink with the straight fins and very small channel size is actually very good uh, for performing. And this is why it's mostly used in all uh, uh, consumer heat sink products. But if you look at the objective in function of the pressure drop, then it's another story. So you can see that you actually can get a very good uh, temperature elevation or very low temperature elevation for a much, much lower pressure drop. And if you have a much lower pressure drop, you will get also a much lower pumping power. 
So at the maximum, we can actually reduce the pressure drop, uh, the temperature by 70% for the same pressure drop using a 3D design, which is hopefully the best performing one compared to the uh, other with the uh, manufacturing filter. And you can also, if you fix the same temperature elevation, reduce the pressure drop by a maximum of 90%. And if you think about data centers where most of the energy is used for cooling, if you can decrease this pressure drop and the cooling power, then it would be a, a very good outcome. So now the conclusion and some future work that we have planned. So first we have done a routine to export uh, high quality meshes. And it's mostly to validate the results of the optimization framework, because as most of you know, you cannot just take the results of your optimization and say that this is the truth. You need to validate it before bringing to others and discuss about it. Then the best performing optimized heating is, uh, is the one using the PD filter, the 3D one, which highlights that we need the three dimensionality for the flow uh, inside the heat sink and the 2D model is, uh, is uh, not the best and will not get uh, good performances compared to this one. Then the current method is still limited for higher pressure drop. The more uh, pressure drop you, you have, the less uh, the validation will be uh, okay using a CFT. And for that, you need a higher mesh resolution. And then of course you will get much, much uh, longer time to compute and calculate your design. Then, of course, in this one, the heat map is still simple. It's, a sim it's just a, a surface with a fixed uh, heat flux. And of course, if you want to design real heating, you will need the real heat map of CPU. So you can actually smartly distribute the material depending on where the hotspots are. And then, of course, you can find uh, more information on a uh, paper that we have uh, just published, which is uh, from uh, which this presentation is from. So. Yeah, I think I uh, have 11 minutes, so good. <laughs> you did a great job, Bryce, not only staying in time, but giving this wonderful presentation. So thank you very much. Again, Thanks. I would like an, like to open the floor for questions. So please, audience, some, please un, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Can I have one, uh, Kurt? Yeah, for sure, Matthias. <laughs> OK, thanks, Bryce, since you, you mentioned the uh, what was it the, the machining filter already mm. i couldn't resist <laughs> so uh, you showed that the, the complete 3d design uh, is, is, is the best performing one mm. so I, I was actually surprised to see that then you didn't include a uh, a design with uh, a 3d printing uh, manufacturing uh, restriction on it because the 3d design uh, still looked really complex to make right so yes it's, it's yeah. indeed in your simulation the best but in the end of course, what you can really put on that CPU, mm -hmm. that, that is what matters. Have yeah, you uh, made, had any thoughts about that? No, we haven't uh, implemented the uh, overhang uh, instance uh, filter to limit the, the angle of the, of the material. And this is uh, some work we will just implement in the future work, but for now it's, uh, it's basically free to grow everywhere. And uh, of course, this is uh, far from being completely manufacturable right now, but it's just a showcase of how much performances you can still gain from giving full freedom. But of course, if you go for the real for the, for the real case, uh, this won't be as, as performing as the, this example. Yeah, but I guess with the, the printed one, you probably end up somewhere in between. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Okay, nice. Thanks. Any other questions? We have time for one. If there's nobody else, I would like to ask a question. You know, kind of you make this the statement that your current method is limited essentially to these higher pressure drop cases and and you know, kind of if we want to go for higher Reynolds number in particular, you know, kind of how do we mesh it? Have you thought about it? You know, what is what is your approach to dealing with that? You know, kind of how can you make sure that you pick a sufficiently fine mesh? Well, for the mesh is uh, mostly how how is your the development of your velocity profile in the uh, in the transverse direction of your channel. So, the number of nine well, is much more about experience and how what is the minimum size you need in the channel to get uh, the right temperature boundary uh, in in your profile. And then for the pressure drop, we mostly play with the alpha max in your in your formulation for your. Uh, interpolation 
and the higher the alpha max will be, then the better you will, uh, you will have better representation in compared with the discrete uh, solution it will be, but then uh, simulation time might just explode and you might have also instabilities and even crashing of the simulation. So it's uh, it's kind of a, a balance. You can have a low alpha max at the, uh, at the beginning and then increase it once. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I see you struggle with the same things we struggle too. Okay, good yes. to know. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bryce. That was a great talk. Uh, let's move on to uh, a little bit further west. You see that was the selection criteria for the order of the talks. I moved from east to west and we moved just a few kilometers to the west. And our next presenter is Joe Alexanderson from the University of Southern Denmark. Joe is an associate professor at the Department of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. His research focuses on topology optimization of fluid and heat transfer problems using simplified models as well as high fidelity models uh, with large scale parallel computing. Joe, it's all yours. Thanks a lot, Kurt. <clears throat> so yeah, for a change, I'm not showing fancy color pictures and big 3D things. So I feel a little bit out of my comfort zone. <clears throat> but I just uh, published a paper where I go back and try to give a detailed introduction to density-based topology optimization of fluid flow problems. So the paper is very detailed. Uh, the presentation will be very fast. <clears throat> so the main motivation for this has been uh, that there are we, we have a good tr uh, tradition in SMO and our community in general that we publish these educational papers, how to implement methods and so on, usually including some kind of code. The vast majority are MATLAB codes. <clears throat> of course, we all know the famous 99 line code and the subsequent different uh, uh, extensions of it. And then there exist codes for many other topology optimization approaches, level set, uh, phase field, and all these kind of different things. But there isn't really a paper and a, a code for fluid flow topology optimization. Um, fluid flow topology optimization started back in 2003. So it's getting relatively old, I guess, 20, 20 years this year. And uh, I would say that it's pretty mature for steady state laminar flow, at least if we think just purely flow, no additional physics. <clears throat> there is one code from 2016, but it focuses more on this stable discretization using virtual elements or uh, hexagonal finite elements. Um, so I don't feel it provides what I want to provide with this paper. Uh, it's also a little bit, my motivation is quite uh, self-centered. I'm getting tired of getting a lot of emails and questions from my own students as well. Uh, and just generally uh, people are spending a lot of time and energy on trying to relearn things that uh, we could try to push them uh, and, and get a head start. So I made this tutorial paper uh, with uh, basic MATLAB code. It's not so basic, it's pretty big. Um, and then the paper ended up being 28 pages. So it's a thick boy, but um, it goes into depth with a step-by-step -step guide on, on how to get into these things. So in a, in a galaxy not too far away, there is a MATLAB paper or a MATLAB code coming, maybe if the animation works, here we go. So uh, it's very long and it consists of multiple files. So this whole line counting I've, uh, I dropped. So it's, it's just a big code. And there's a bunch of things that are different than sort of the main uh, normal um, linear mechanics um, approaches. There's the nonlinear solver for the finite element discretization. Fluid mechanics is just more difficult. It's a uh, nonlinear. We have this different way of interpolating things and so on. And it's all explained in a step-by-step -step manner in the paper. Um, <clears throat> just briefly sort of, uh, for those of you who are not aware, the sort of ideal case, the physical case is that we have solid domains that are well-defined with a clear interface that are fully separated from the fluid domains. That's kind of what exists in nature and that's what we want to simulate ideally. 
but we're going to use a density field approach and we're going to introduce a design field that is basically the characteristic function for the fluid field. So if we're one, we're in the fluid domain and if it's zero, we're in the solid. Then we relax this as we usually do to a continuous variable that continues from zero to one and we have these intermediate areas or intermediate uh, variables and then how to, to interpolate and how to add this into our physics. So we take the starting point, the steady state incompressible Navier-Stokes equations with a body force here. And we're going to use this body force to introduce a solid that is immersed in the fluid. So we're going to add a resistance term, which is alpha times the velocity. So this is a destruction term. So it basically sucks out the momentum of the fluid in the regions where alpha is larger than zero. So ideally we would have alpha is infinity in the solids that would ensure that in this equation, it says UI equals to zero, so no velocities. And then in the fluid, we would have zero to recover the original Navier-Stokes equations. Numerically, we can't do that. And also we are adding this, deter or this uh, design field or characteristic function um, is now determining what should this alpha be? And how do we design, define this alpha as a function of gamma? So the bounds are relatively simple. We have a minimum and a maximum. So we can't do infinity numerically. That doesn't work. Uh, and then the minimum doesn't have to be zero. In 3D, it should be zero, at least if we have no, uh, no microstructure in interacting with the flow. But in 2D, very often we have a finite out of uh, out of plane extension with no slip walls, and then we actually do need a physical quantity that is non-zero. <clears throat> and then we use some kind of interpolation function. I like the ramp, and then that's how you sort of control the interpolation of your Brinkman. I could talk for a very long time about this, but it's all in the paper. The discretization happens using the simplest, at least in theory, elements. So we have equal order bilinear finite elements. So that means we have uh, square elements, or they could be rectangular actually, but the velocities and the pressures are placed on the corner nodes. And then we have a piecewise constant design field for each element. And then we're using bilinear functions to interpolate into the element. The measure and all this follows the uh, the 99, well, it's the 88 line code sort of format and numbering and so on. And then I'm using a fully vectorized assembly and fully vectorized sort of uh, approach to building all the uh, local matrices. These are the weak forms, they're horrible. Uh, we have this stabilization we have to take care of. I won't go into the details there either. Um, this gives us a nonlinear residual equation that we have to solve. I do it using a damp Newton, where we also have to determine what should the damping factor be. Uh, and then where I depart from what I'm, I usually do is I've been brought up by you do by hand, you derive your discrete adjoint equations and you impl implement the, the everything into it, then you make mistakes, then you do a finite difference check, and then you do a mistake in that. And then finally you get it working, but now I just uh, compute everything symbolically using the MATLAB symbolic toolbox. So that means basically define your weak form well, uh, residual equations by looping through a bunch of indices, and then you derive the Jacobian by just asking MATLAB to differentiate. And then you can export these to vectorized MATLAB functions. So that means we can throw in the information for all elements at the same time, and we get back the local residual and the local Jacobian for all elements at the same time. The default problem is to minimize dissipated energy with a constraint on fluid volume. And again, in MATLAB symbolic toolbox, you define the objective function uh, looping over the indices here. And then to get the, use the adjoint method, we have to get four 
partial derivatives, this one, this one, and this one, this one. That's what very often takes place in hand. But here again, MATLAB symbolic toolbox handles this. So I think we are getting lazy pretty much uh, everywhere in society, but here also, this is symbolic differentiation, but there's also automatic differentiation and they're really powerful tools. You don't have to do a finite difference check because if you made a mistake in your objective function, you'll get the right sensitivities to the wrong objective. So that it's a little bit dangerous, but at least it's very easy and you can quickly change your, your function and then just run the same file and you get your uh, gradients out. Joe, three minutes. Yeah. The, uh, the two benchmark problems is the double pipe problem and the pipe problem. These two are implemented in the code already. Um, you can run it for some different things and get these canonical results from Borval and Pedersen and so on. And then what's more important is how to extend the code. So that's introduced how to introduce passive elements. This is pretty standard. Uh, how to build in the MMA optimizer, which is now uh, open source uh, license, so we don't have to send an email to Svanberg anymore. And then in detail, describe how to change the objective to a flow reversal problem or a minimum drag and maximum lift problem. So these are all uh, problems trying to recreate results from, from the literature. So one is this flow reversal where we want in the midpoint, the velocity to point in the other direction. So we get these results, which again, resemble what um, um, Gaspar Hansen did. And here we have it for a higher velocity flow. So it's Navier-Stokes flow. So we can do both Stokes flow by setting the, the viscosity to be very high or the Reynolds number to be very low, but we can also do Navier-Stokes flow up to the sort of steady limit, at least. We can also do drag and lift by a condo. So based on the integrals of the, the forces that we introduce, the body forces from the Brinkman penalization, there we can do minimum drag, and then we can take these drag designs and maximize the lift under some constraint on how much is the drag allowed to, to increase. Um, I tested it on two machines. So my uh, itty bitty laptop and then my, my bigger workstation here and I ran it for some of the different problems to see how, how long time does it take? How, how much memory does it want? And the conclusion is it's significantly slower than the static mechanics ones. And there are multiple reasons for that. One is the nonlinear problem. So we have to do a Newton iteration. We have complicated finite element formulations with a bunch of contributions. And then the most important is that not all elements have the same matrix. So we can't do this uh, sort of trick where we just have one matrix and multiply it by the local stiffness. So that takes uh, quite a long time. Now I'm running out of time. I just wanted to show we can do pretty big stuff. If you have the time to wait, I also suggest some ways to speeding this up, which also work. And I use it always in my, my 3D stuff. Um, but yeah, to conclude, uh, I hope this paper will be a first point of entry for newcomers to get quickly started. So of course, this is not the true answer. It is my approach to things and people should still read all the other papers, but they don't necessarily have to, to get started. The code is also Octave compatible, but not the symbolic stuff. Octave's symbolic toolbox is pretty crappy. Um, and then, yeah, I use this symbolic toolbox for all the partial derivatives and stuff and vectorized output for fast assembly. And the paper is in SMO and the code is on GitHub. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for your nice presentation, but also thank you for this service to the community. I, I think that is actually really addressing a big problem, how you get students into flow topology optimization. So thank you very much. We have time for a quick question. Can I go, Kerr? To... Yes, please. So, so thank you, Joe. Very interesting. And it is very useful, at least for the classes that we are teaching. Usually we don't have time to go through the flow part. And right. that is very important. Thank you. I appreciate it. So Thanks. in the optimization, you said in the extension part, you said that you use MMA. 
So, yes. But before that, you use the building function of the op optimization, like Fincon. No, I actually use an optimality criteria solver. So okay. it, it works correctly for Stokes slope, and it seems to work pretty decently for Navier Stokes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thanks again, Joe, for your nice presentation. Thank you. And let's move to our final presentation of today's top webinar. Our final presentation will be given by uh, David-Henri Garnier. Um, David-Henri is currently a third-year PhD student at the computer lab at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Uh, his PhD is on new approaches to 3D modeling by introducing living characteristics into traditional 3D modeling, such as emergence, environment adaptation, ability to self-repair, or temporal evolution. So I'm really looking forward to your talk. David Henri, take it from here, please. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, 3D modeling with uh, reaction diffusion through this presentation uh, of our paper, uh, Growth of Oriented Orthotropic Structures with Reaction Diffusion. So this work has been conducted by uh, Martin Pierre Schmidt, uh, who is also attending this call, and Damien Romer and myself. So the general idea of this paper is to design uh, conformal lattice-like structures using a model of reaction diffusion, and uh, it has been published in SMO a couple of months ago. So for context, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Mott said, uh, I'm a third year PhD student, and uh, my work is focused on interactive 3D modeling of bio-inspired uh, emergent shapes. So it is well known that lattice structures uh, show good mechanical and uh, elastic properties while remaining uh, very lightweight. However, uh, in computer-aided design, uh, precise uh, lattice design can be complex and just a simple unit cell repetition won't give a global uh, optimal structure for specific loads. Uh, but we can notice that organic structures are naturally porous and uh, show this kind of lattice-like design, so it motivates to seek for more bio-inspired approaches. This is why we introduced this, this method relying on reaction diffusion, which is a critical model uh, in the field of morphogenesis. The purpose of this method is to grow uh, lattice-like structures inside the prescribed uh, 3D shape and conformly to an orientation field. So these are our uh, contributions. So we propose a general method to, for designing field conformal lattice-like and membrane-like uh, structures compatible with the workflow of topology optimization. Uh, it's also a novel approach uh, based on classic reaction diffusion model to design a global structure using an anisotropic growth of uh, microstructures. And so our method uh, differs from existing work because it's based on, on local growth. So it's, it is robust to designer modifications and uh, it generates patterns uh, properly connected. Also, this is a new process to design structures, which constitutes a good trade-off between stiffness property and resistance to buckling, despite not being an optimizer of these uh, properties. So this is uh, the general pipeline of uh, our method. Uh, it divides into two major steps. So the first one, uh, which is called uh, pattern growth, uh, takes three inputs. So scalar field uh, row, which controls uh, pattern localization the tensor field sigma, which defines the local orientation of the pattern, and the scalar field gamma, which indicates areas uh, that should be infilled with homogeneous material. Uh, so this first step returns uh, in intermediate oriented structures. Uh, there are two or three intermediate uh, scalar fields, depending uh, on uh, the dimension, 2D or 3D. And once these uh, intermediate fields are generated, the final lattice structure results from a combination of these different substructures during the second step. Uh, so now I'm going to describe more, more precisely what are uh, the inputs uh, using uh, just a concrete example. Uh, so we could take any field giving uh, a desired lattice localization and a and desired uh, lattice local orientation, but results from topology uh, optimization gives an interesting case of application in the context of uh, structural optimization. So here, for instance, as a case study, uh, we use the results uh, returned by the SIMP method for the continuous scenario. And so uh, if we focus more on the three inputs, uh, our first input row, which we call uh, infill space, 
gives uh, the global shape of the structure that we want to infill with lattice. So it can be the output of topology optimization uh, pro problem resolved with the same method, for instance. Uh, so this is a continuous density field with uh, very few intermediate values between black and white. Uh, so it clearly defines solid and void areas. Second input is uh, sigma uh, is a tensor field uh, which defines uh, the local orientation of the lattice. In our concrete case, uh, and being aware of the stress allied property for stiffness uh, in improvement in the single load case, we can simply use the stress orientation, which will give us a rotation field with two or three principal directions. Finally, uh, the infill map gamma indicates uh, areas to infill with uh, homogeneous material. So it can be manually defined by the designer, but uh, we can also automatically infill areas where uh, the anisotropy is not clearly defined, such uh, in the, the gray areas. Uh, in these areas, the lattice orientation itself is not well defined. So we can spot these areas by computing the local uh, consistence of the, of the alignment of the eigenvectors. So now that I spoke about the inputs, uh, I'm going to present the core of the method. So reaction diffusion equations are partial derivative uh, equations, which were initially introduced by Turing in 1952 to explain pattern formation uh, in nature. Uh, and here we focus on a precise model, uh, which is called the Grescott model. And we're going to use this model as a tool to generate smooth uh, oriented patterns. So the Grescott model uh, were initially introduced to describe the kinetics of a chemical reaction between two species uh, U and V by the reaction, the chemical reaction U plus 2V gives 3V. And uh, this uh, set of equations gives a variation of the different chemical concentrations in space and time. Uh, in the historical models, the two species diffuse uh, isotropically, but with different diffu diffusion coefficients. So that's why the small d has to be different uh, from one. And the two parameters can control the appearance and the shapes of the resulting patterns, uh, F uh, as a feed, because uh, the chemical U is added uh, to a given feed rate F, and K as a kill, because the chemical V is removed at a given kill rate uh, K. So the integration of the, this equation gives uh, this kind of uh, pattern from well-chosen values for F and K. So here we can uh, see on the animation the, the evolution of the concentration of the species V, but it will be the, the concentration for uh, U would give a similar, something similar. So starting with this uh, model, we added some modifications. Uh, each modification involves uh, one of the inputs we I presented. Uh, first, uh, we enforced that one species uh, now diffuse anisotropically, conformally to a tensor sigma, which can vary in space. And uh, we choose to have only one anisotropic species because if the two of them diffuse anisotropically, it is in, induce some numerical error when integrating the equation on a, on a regular grid. Three minutes. And so, yeah. And so we can see that now the patterns are oriented along the tensor field. So second modifications uh, consist to restrict uh, the reaction in an area of uh, interest defined by the scalar field row. This term uh, uh, is exponentially killed uh, outside the, the area. And the last modification uh, is to extend the value K to a space varying field defined by uh, the term that uh, you can see here. And uh, we basically just multiply K by uh, this term and uh, it will completely infill uh, these uh, specific regions. And so uh, in this pattern going step, uh, we simulate uh, independent reaction diffusion processes. Each, pro each process uh, favors one of the main direction of uh, sigma. To this end, uh, we define uh, one anisotropic diffusion tensor for each process built from the input uh, tensor sigma. And so each intermediate structure is described by, by a set of uh, equations like this. So here we can see uh, the growth phase for the cantilever case. So we start uh, uh, by initializing uh, V with a non-zero concentration uh, in, the, in the center, and we let the structure grow like this. And uh, at, a time, uh, at a time when it does not change much, uh, we apply a filter before combining these structures. 
because uh, in order to obtain a better mechanical structure, we are going to enlarge pattern align according, according to the principal directions and to thin the patterns align along the secondary directions. So that's the kind of uh, substructures you obtained after the filtering step. And for the final step, uh, the structure uh, the structure combination uh, can be performed uh, using simple Boolean operations that can be expressed in terms of mean and max functions for density fields. So the 2D case, uh, it's just a simple uh, union of the two substructures. And in the 3D cases, uh, the substructures are composed of parallel shells, which are orthogonal to the three main tensor directions. The Boolean uh, intersection between two, two substructures will give beams oriented along the main directions, and taking the union of all of the beams, all of these beams will give the final uh, lattice structures. So now let's see some some results. But I think I still have two minutes left. Yeah, yeah. Right. Please go yeah. ahead. Okay, so uh, so in 2D, uh, so this is the case of uh, of L-shaped beam. Uh, the, the, imp the input are generated from the L-shaped beam, whose uh, the loads and boundary conditions uh, are shown uh, here in the center. So on the left, the input has been computed from a classical compliance minimization problem, whereas on the right, it's uh, based on peak stress minimization. So it explains uh, why. Uh, so we did the re-entrant uh, corner on the stress minimizing case. So what we can see is that our method generates co coherent oriented microstructures in a variety of uh, optimization problems. And uh, here in 3D, uh, you can see how the whole shapes uh, grow. Uh, so in this case, the input that we use the, our, um, the optimized structure for the G brackets uh, for a single load case and for multi load case. So this still demonstrates uh, that it generates uh, coherent oriented uh, microstructures. Uh, here we try to compare to another paper by uh, Yun Wu, which proposed to design conformal lattice. So taking the same uh, underlying uh, tensor field for this optimized share, we notice that our, our method shows a nice uh, spatial regularity compared to the other one. So this can be interesting for aesthetic reasons. However, you should uh, handle this comparison carefully as if this is only a, a visual comparison. The, the chair on the left is really the output uh, of, an optimization, an, uh, of an optimization process while ours is not. And we also conducted a nonlinear structural analysis uh, to compare two design variants of the same mass. Uh, first is a classic uh, topology optimization design, and the second one is uh, is designed by our, our method. So the first displacement curves uh, of both design uh, initially start with a roughly linear por portion with a steeper slope for the topology optimization design, indica indicating that it achieves a higher stiffness, which is to be expected because it was specifically optimized for maximizing uh, stiffness. However, at a critical load of magnitude, the top-up design undergoes in-plane buckling and collapse. Our design shows near linear deformation and support a peak load approximately 70% higher than the top-up design. So I'm running out of time, but uh, uh, just, I just want to say that our method relies on, on a local process. The designer can interact dynamically with the structure. For instance, the designer can erase some parts and they will automatically self-repair. Also, it is possible to stick different living structures so, so they combine in a clever and organic way. And uh, to conclude, uh, I presented the novel approach to design conforming lattice like structure inspired by morphogenesis, which is a good trade off between pure stiffness uh, property and resistance to buckling. Uh, the resulting structures show nice spatial regularity, uh, and our method differs from traditional ones because it relies on a local process which enables uh, dynamic interactions with the structures. Also, there are some limitations as it's, at, it's not an optimization process, so there is still need for FEM analysis to ensure uh, structural uh, validation. Also, this is a review representation for 3D shapes as it relies on voxel grid, and this is also not, uh, not a non-exact uh, CAD representation. Yeah, sorry for... Uh, Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Very impressive results. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but I encourage everybody online to contact the speakers and discuss their work further with them. Obviously, read their papers. I hope you got all interested. 
learning more about this terrific work. At that point, I would like to thank all speakers for their very interesting, great presentations. And I think I give it back to Yun. You, you introduced everybody. Do you want to say some final concluding words? Yeah, thank you for organizing the session and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Piet, I know you have to go at this moment. And for those of you who would like to ask questions, so I will still be here. And uh, if some of the speakers want to stay and uh, will have questions, uh, please feel free. Yeah, thank you, Kat. Thanks a lot. Sorry, I have to leave. I have to run to a meeting. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks, Kurt. Bye. 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 Thank you. David, uh, I actually have a meet, have a question about your presentation. So, a yep. very interesting results. Uh, what I find uh, in eagle result, you have this gamma, which indicates the infill map, which shows fully black. Is it possible to remove net one and showing fully the same porosity everywhere? Uh, okay. What? Uh... I'm sorry, I didn't uh, quite understand the question. Uh, uh, what do you want to do with uh, the, the You go to your previous, yeah, this one, yeah. you have this uh, infill map, which has yeah. this gray, and the other region is white. And the white region will have quite a uniform porosity. But when it comes to this uh, gray area, the pores, when the, the density is very high. Could you, in your algorithm, if you remove this infill map, allow yeah. everywhere to be with zero, what would happen? Uh, it will not uh, connect uh, well. Actually, that's why that's why we we chose to just color this uh, the problematic region uh, with black with material because uh, okay. it it doesn't connect well. So and in it, it in in the three D case it's uh, it's worse. So okay, yeah. I will definitely read it into the paper. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, if uh, there's no more question, then we see each other in February for the 25th session.